Coming up next on Insights on PBS Hawaii. Hawaii's prepaid health care law has given us the second lowest uninsurance rate in America. But the National Affordable Care Act will expand coverage to families who fall between government paid plans and employer plans. What changes can Hawaii expect from this Affordable Care Act? Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Dan Boylan. The Affordable Care Act has weathered challenges in Congress and in the United States Supreme Court. Yet for all the controversy it's engendered, many of us don't know how its provisions will affect us, especially in Hawaii, where we are one of the nation's leaders in universal health care. Some of the changes have already been in, put in place. The Affordable Care Act allows our children to remain insured by their parents on their, on their policy through age 26. It erases concerns over pre-existing conditions, and it pays for more routine screenings. Starting in October, it will allow Hawaii residents to shop for health care if we, if we are small business owners or if we're self-employed or if we're uninsured. Except for the poorest among us, if we don't get insurance by 2014, we could face a fine under this new law. Tonight, in the first of two shows about health insurance reform, we ask the question, what changes can Hawaii expect? from the Affordable Care Act. What can we expect in terms of affordability and accessibility? You can join our conversation by calling, emailing, or tweeting your questions and comments. The contact information you now see on your screen will be repeated throughout the program. Insights is also streaming live on your computer and will be posted on your website. On our website, your website, if you've got one, we'll, pbshawaii.org, after the broadcast. The live stream, like our broadcast, is also closed caption. Now to our panel. Coral Andrews is executive director of the Hawaii Health Connector. A retired Navy captain, Coral worked as a nurse during her military service. Dr. Josh Green is a practicing emergency room physician on the Big Island. He has been a state senator since 2008 and now serves as chairman of the Senate Health Committee. Dr. Stephen Bradley has been with the Waianae Coast Comprehensive Health Center since 1994. For the past two years, he has been its chief medical officer. Ginny Pressler is the executive vice, vice president and chief strategic officer at Hawaii Pacific Health, which operates four hospitals on Oahu and Kauai. While in private practice, Dr. Pressler was a general surgeon who specialized in breast cancer research. Uh, Ginny uh, and Josh have been on so many shows that we've done on healthcare that if I get in trouble, you guys just take over and I'll sit back and watch. Uh, Coral, but you're the, you're the woman of the evening in many regards, the, the, the health connector. On October 1st, everybody's <coughs> supposedly going to have some place to go buy health insurance and find lower, to shop, set up by the state for the Affordable Care Act. How does this work? Where's it, where's it going to be? How are we going to get low priced health care? Sure. Well, thank you, Dan. The Hawaii Health Connector was established through legislation in <clears throat> the 2011 legislative session, and we are a nonprofit organization, but we are we work very closely with the state. And in fact, in the course of us building this web portal that's going to enable consumers and small businesses to be able to access health insurance options, um, coupled with that, we're working very closely with the Department of Human Services, who's also doing a build. In, um, in building a new eligibility and enrollment system. So how all of this is going to work is we've been over the last year and a half in a build phase and just building the IT infrastructure, the web portal. So much like consumers go to um, online shop for many things, nowadays there's an infrastructure that has to be created. So we were starting from scratch. Um, come October, they'll be able to see this web portal and have choices um, of different plans that they'll be able to purchase. The customers that will come will be individuals and, and small businesses. And we have, um, in addition to this IT infrastructure, we have a very robust community outreach um, activity, uh, much of which the public will begin to see in this next eight weeks as we roll forward to October the 1st. Um, the same activities happening nationally and so as we have this conversation this evening, I'll try to help 
uh, filter sort of the differences in Hawaii's state-based exchange and what they're seeing nationally in states that have elected to have a federally run exchange. Um, but the idea behind it is that we are bringing information to customers, so we're different than patients, and that in that um, engagement we will have marketplace assisters who um, are organizations already working with individuals and small businesses and they'll be providing the information to the consumer to assist the consumer in knowing how to approach that buying experience and in choosing health insurance. Uh, but what if you gave a market and nobody came? As I understand mm -hmm. it, only two, uh, the, the big guys are, are in it, right? Kaiser Permanente and HMSA are the only ones who have come forward, right? So there's been some self-disclosure of participation, but the actual formal announcements of who will be participating hasn't concluded yet. Um, there's a process where issuers give a letter of intent and then there are formal agreements that they sign. And, and the Act 205 that established us in the 2011 session really distinguishes what our role and relationship is in regulating and rate, establishing rates. That still resides with the insurance commissioner um, within the State Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. So there will still be choice. And um, you know, for the population of the uninsured, for example, it, even if the you know even if the construct is that we do have two participating issues within that there will be more choice more options um, there are subsidies that will be available to them so that as they approach the options they'll be able to uh, perhaps qualify for some offsets based on their income so I think it's important that the listeners understand when they hear the information there are many variables that go into expanding choice some of which is who's participating, but it's also what's the menu of what they're bringing to the table. And, um, and so I think that the, um, the, that the uninsured currently, you know, they don't have insurance. There are reasons why they don't have insurance, some of which is affordability, some is really the health literacy aspects around that. And so I look forward to really having a, you know, broadening the conversation beyond just sort of who's who's participating on the exchange. And we have dental issuers as well. Josh, are you bothered by there only being two, uh, two insurance operations coming forward? Uh, a little bit. I mean, I think that it's a living organism, though. So in the coming years, I would expect more to, to come aboard. Now, wait a minute. What's a living organism? <laughs> hey, hey, hey. What's the living organism? So the the uh, exchange is the organism. And so in the first year, there's going to be kinks to work out, there's no question, and what Coral's doing is really quite extraordinary because they had to build it from the ground up. So I think as people see across the country and in Hawaii that this is here to stay, I think some of the other insurers will get involved. I do know that um, there's a new insurance com and company, uh, company coming into the state of Hawaii. J.P. Schmidt, former commissioner, uh, insurance commissioner, is running that thing. So I think that some of the others may get on board. Uh, there's a lot of other things when I say living organism that we have to take into account. It may, uh, in the first year, just be the silver and gold plans. Maybe two years from now, there'll be other plans, the plans that are a little less expensive and a little less robust that enter into the system. I don't know, but that's why I say it's living. And when it's a market, to give people options, the 80 to 100 or 100,000 or so people that need insurance in our state, I think that a lot of what their desires are will end up getting reflected in the exchange in the next couple of years. So that's why I say it's living. I think that what the exchange looks like in October and November this year may, very, may be very different two or three years from now. Right. I, I would like to build on what Josh said. So there's a, you know, as the um, community is trying to filter this information, I know when we arrived here this evening, we had a co brief conversation, you and I, about just how to get our heads around where there's so much information. And um, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Secretary Sebelius, had sort of a wonderful way of trying to define even the IT systems. You know, the open enrollment begins in October, but that's just the beginning. And that open enrollment period will run through March. And the IT systems will mature. Because what we've been asked to do is to build something in a year and a half or so that normally takes three years. I mean, if you talk to the folks that are implementing electronic health records and they tell you, you know, the front to, to back um, implementation of just something like that, we're trying to get this exchange up and running in a very compressed period of time. So we will be opening, there will be some uh, supported manual processes um, 
And then as we mature through the next uh, six months, just like all the other state-based marketplaces of which there are 16. I did want to clarify though that in the markets that we're servicing, which will be individual and small business, the Prepaid Health Care Act has been around since 1974. And so Hawaii very pridefully was ahead of many other states. And we've had to create a small business side of the exchange that synthesizes those two. So the plan structures will, will reflect both prepaid and ACA, whereas on the individual side of the exchange, there will be four levels of plans that it issuers or uh, consumers can choose from. I, I was reading about Massachusetts. You mentioned uh, mm -hmm. you mentioned silver and gold plans, and they, and, they, and they said that most of the people who have signed up, they have essentially Obamacare, yeah. but it was uh, Romney Care, Romney Care, uh, Romney <laughs> Care. Uh, and in, in, in Romney Care, they've covered an awful lot of people. But most of the new signups are in something called the Bronze mm -hmm. Plan. This is a stripped down plan, is that? Yeah, it's a, it's a little less full. So Hawaii's been lucky because we've offered extraordinary coverage. The silver and, and gold plans, because of, the afford, because of the Prepaid Health Act going back, has really meant that people get complete comprehensive coverage. But there are some, some people that would prefer to have less, less coverage and a lot less expensive um, coverage. And so that may very well be where the people in their 20s and 30s land. They uh, make less money. They have far fewer major health concerns that might be good for them. It's a major question, major debate. Yeah. Uh, Jenny, uh, we've, we've mentioned that, that, that part of the Affordable Care Act has been in effect now for quite a while. Mm -hmm. for, uh, quite a while. What effect has it had on your hospitals? Has it had any effect on your hospitals? Well, we've been working on health reform long before the Affordable Care Act even came to be. And I think what the Affordable Care Act has done has accelerate the things that we've already been working on, which are providing better quality, better access, better patient satisfaction, more focus on the outcomes of care rather than just the process and the number of cases that you do, but how, how are the patients actually doing? Are you improving their blood pressure? Are you improving their diabetes care? Are you getting their immunizations, the screenings that they need? Uh, those things are the th we've been focusing on for the last few years, and I'm very proud of the things <coughs> that we've uh, accomplished there. And now we're taking it to the next level, where we've got uh, a new uh, physician enterprise that allows not just the four hospitals of Hawaii Pacific Health and our clinics and our employed physicians, but reaching out to offer uh, physicians in private practice to get the support systems that we're providing to the rest of our um, physicians so that the, the, as the uh, in public goes out to the connector and other places to get their health insurance, we're, we're providing the best possible care, which is improving every day. You you work in a part of uh, town, uh, David, uh, where, where a part of town, a, a part of town uh, where where you're you're likely to run into an awful lot of people who would be on the bronze plan or or less, mm -hmm. uh, or looking for something less than the bronze plan. Well, you know, it's been or this, getting help uh, uh, or getting, getting some help, sort of subsidy. Right? Yeah, it's interesting. I drive from town out to Y and I every day, and you know everyone thinks that Y and I is this community that just solely is an underserved, underprivileged community where everyone's on Medicaid, and I. I do say that as a uh, federally qualified health center, 60% uh, plus of our patients are uh, Medicaid patients. But as I go out, I see a line of cars coming into town, and those people are coming in to, to work every day. So there's a, a large population of uh, people coming in to work. And the problem is, what sort of job do they have? Is it a job that is 20 hours and above that's going to afford them health care insurance under uh, the prepaid health act or is it not a lot of those folks may be working two maybe three jobs that just come under that and they're scrambling they're scrambling to feed their families and they can't afford the rates of health insurance for a private person today so that's where the uh, the uh, affordable care act really becomes a, a, an important factor because of the way it's staged the fact is that now medicaid is going to begin at 133 percent of the federal poverty level and anyone below that is obviously um, eligible for Medicaid, so there's no problem. But from 100% to 400% of the federal poverty level, you're now going to have levels of uh, subsidies for people that when they do go to the connector, it's not going to be a full out-of-pocket payment for their insurance. They are going to have some help. And this is especially important with the younger people who are just out, maybe their first jobs, whatever it is, they're not making that much. They may be making more than 133%, so they don't qualify for Medicaid, but those are the folks that were out there 
mostly healthy, but what happened when they got sick? They didn't have any health care insurance, so they had to go to the emergency rooms. That's awfully expensive way to provide health care, and it's certainly not continuity of care, and it's sickness care rather than looking for wellness, which is what really, I think, in the healthcare profession, we're looking to keep people from getting sick rather than just curing their sicknesses. Yeah, and I, I think it's important to appreciate <coughs> that in Hawaii, which you've already alluded to, Dan, the, the, uh, the health connector is as important as it is. It's going to help get coverage for those individuals who haven't had it in the past. It's a, the, the connector is a small piece of the overall Affordable Care Act's much, much smaller impact in Hawaii than it is other places since we only have about 8% uninsured. So for the majority of those listening, this is not going to have much of an impact on them at all. Uh, and that's why, you know, our focus on the pro providing care, the focus is on let's keep improving the care and make sure the care is better regardless of where you get it. The connector will be another place for people to go to get health insurance and provides new options mm -hmm. for the particularly individuals uh, who were uninsured in the past. Mm -hmm. well, you know, I, say, well, what I think what we're alluding to is that we have to get everyone covered. That's been kind of a fundamental tenet of the, of the Affordable Care Act. The country with 45, 50 million people uninsured, it was just a disaster. Now that we're going to get everyone covered, how do we actually take care of those people? And, and Ginny is talking about quality <coughs> programs like patient center medical home, physician health organizations, uh, independent physicians are clustering all over to form these uh, kind of hooies as we describe them so that we don't just have uh, patients being cared for by doctors. We've talked a little bit about this, but that's a big piece of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, and that is to restructure the way we care for people. We have a medical home for people. We are going to see a lot more pay up front uh, based on the number of patients that a provider takes care of in these large families of care, and less of the money is just going to be churned out. And so the whole system is changing right before our eyes, but most of the Affordable Care Act was actually meant to push money towards primary care and prevention and diminish the amount of money that we spent at disastrous moments in people's lives if they've had very uncontrolled diabetes, if they've had renal failure, if they have a heart attack at much too early an age. So we're part of a process right now, and this is going to be like a 20-year process to get our healthcare system right, but each <coughs> one of us is taking on a different piece of it. May I build on sure. what Josh just said? So as I sit aside my colleagues here, many whom I've known for quite some time, I think what's important for the listeners to start to try to get their heads around is you know, the law started in 2010 and with that rolled out certain components of it. And, and many of that, it, much of that is focused on the health service delivery. So then as the exchanges come in or these marketplaces, there's a new nomenclature that comes along with that. We're residing in sort of an entrepreneurial space. We're a tech startup company. And in that tech startup company, the business strategy is customer relationship management. So you'll, we all are part of this collective effort, but for the exchanges, we have customers or consumers or small businesses. When you talk about it on the health service delivery side, there are patients and providers. And so sometimes there's confusion when folks hear about health information technology. There's a lot of health information technology activity going on but it's centered in different components or places. And I think the other thing is just also um, both uh, how we align and how the words are, are sort of measured differently is how do you evaluate the, what's the value proposition of each and how do you measure it? Within the healthcare system, there are metrics around quality and, and um, things that physicians and others will be held to in terms of uh, the services that they deliver and how that's evaluated. For us, it's about the customer experience. And, you know, we've had an opportunity to really contemplate from the ground up, you know, how do we even brand this organization as a state-based marketplace? And so I want, our, I want our community to understand that we've put a lot of thought into where the community informs that process and how the host culture creates a uniqueness about Hawaii's state-based marketplace that will be distinguished as they look at other marketplaces in other states. Uh, one of the things uh, that I think uh, is, maybe it's just my political background, <coughs> but one of the things that interests me is uh, uh, about what marks our culture is apathy. If we've had uh, so many years of being number two in the country, or sometimes number one, I think at some point uh, in terms of health care coverage, a lot of people are going to come to October 1st and say, why? 
right? Why do I, why do I need this, right? Or just, yeah, yeah, yeah never mind, right? And, and, and then, what, then what do we do? Yeah, well, what do we do? Because same. everybody's going to buy in, right? If we don't buy in, it's not going to work. I, I can give you some perspective, though, on why everyone has to participate and why this has to be something that we look at as a common purpose for society. Uh, we spend about $9 billion on health care in the state, and mm -hmm. sometimes we spend it very badly. When someone comes and sees me at the ER, like tomorrow when I'm on my ER shift, they come in for something very simple because they didn't have a primary care provider or because they couldn't make it at the right hours. And it's very expensive. I don't maybe give as good follow-up back to their primary care physician as, as I could. And we don't improve their overall health. But we're all part of that cost. And if we spend our money badly on health care, mm -hmm. we don't have as much resource to spend on the good <coughs> things like immunizations, on prevention, on working on diabetes early on. So we all have to get a, on board. It's really kind of important that we do our best to be in this case, in this model, insured, and that we have a primary care provider, whether it's a doc or nurse practitioner. So the apathy is there, and I understand when I was 27 years old, I didn't care whether I was insured or not. I felt like there's nothing that could beat me, and that's usually the case. You're going to be well, but God forbid something happens to you, or when you're 40 and you're not insured and you haven't bought into the system, everyone else will have to help carry the weight that you delivered on the healthcare system. And if we're really going to move forward in our society, we do have to contain these costs to a degree and take personal responsibility for ourselves. Walk, not smoke, prevent these diseases so that we have money for our children and grandchildren. Yeah, but, but, but you're talking about the invulnerability of, of youth, that we all think we're going to live forever, we're in great shape, we're not, you, know, they're, they're, you know, they're all down there working out at 24-hour fitness or somewhere. Uh, they're they're going to live forever. Uh, uh, how do, you, how do you get by that? I mean, you, you haven't got time out at your clinic to go up sign saying, look, if you're young, be sure you get hold of this uh, connector, right? You don't have signs up in your hospital, do you, in your hospitals, right, saying get, get in touch with, your, with, with the well, connector. Well, not yet, but maybe we will. <laughs> so let me, let, me, let me respond to two things. One is you raised a question about apathy, and I'll just share what we've learned in the course of coming into affecting change, and I think all of us, I mean, the healthcare industry as a whole is just constantly changing. And so sometimes it's a matter of just looking at the change and acknowledging that it's going to create some level of turbulence. But there are many things that can be done to enable uh, a more streamlined movement through that change. So I would say, you know, given the sort of the political aspects and political discussion and and um, the varied points of view naturally create some level of apathy around this. But what we find, at least in our outreach activities, just person to person here in our community, is more about just helping to clarify what all of this means. Because um, once people understand that it's about enabling those that can't afford or for small businesses, it's not mandated. As Jenny said, I mean, we have a wonderful foundation here in Hawaii to build off of with the Prepaid Health Care Act. So for the small businesses that are listening, in Hawaii, not much is really going to change for them. They have an opportunity to access tax credits. If that helps them to address some of their margins, you know, that's available through the connector. But I, I would just say that, you know, part of this is just messaging and having conversations and investing the time and helping the community to understand the relevance of it. And I think Hawaii is uniquely positioned above many other states simply because our value system is, it's, it's, we have a social responsibility. But Stephen, do your docs and your nurses have time to talk to folks about raising their consciousness of getting involved in this? We try to raise their consciousness in a lot of ways, but you know what was coming to my mind here when we're talking about apathy and we're talking about the youth, which is very true, the invulner invulnerability factor. Since kids can stay on their, fa their, their, their parents' plan until 26, we sort of get past that major hurdle right there. By the time we get past 26, a lot of people are starting families. I think all of a sudden, the consciousness level gets raised. They're also out there, perhaps they're self-employed. Now they're thinking about, what do I do? There's levels we may have in this bill gotten past a lot of that problem because of that ability to extend people's uh, insurance till 26 on their, on their uh, parents' plan. Once they have kids, too. Once people have Once kids, they're into they're the serious. family, now they're going to be thinking about that because the kids get insurance. 
the uh, even in, in an underprivileged area, in a, in a, a problem, uh, underserved area, the women, when they're pregnant, are automatically insured. So now you have an insurance factor that's built in. I'm thinking maybe it won't be quite as difficult as we're thinking. So who are we marketing this to? And that might be one of the fine-tuning aspects right. that we're going to get very, into. Very broad. And um, one of the questions that we ask in going out and engaging in the public forums is, how many, asking the audience, you know, how many of you are either uninsured or know someone who's uninsured? I spoke to a group um, uh, along with Tom Matsuda from the governor's office to the board of realtors and two thirds of that room raised their hand. So I think we, we do need to do a better job, all of us collectively, of sort of finding a word. Maybe uninsured has a certain connotation to it. People think that it is a certain you know, um, impoverished population. It is that, but it's also in this economy, it, it's become even a, you know, sort of a middle class issue. And I think that, you know, part of it is just making it relevant. And, and I think just given what we're seeing in the outreach activities, when you ask people that question, there's a very broad audience that raises their hands. So it's about reshaping an understanding of who are the uninsured. My husband lost his job from Aloha Airlines in 36 hours three years ago. And, um, you know, there's still pilots out there that are uninsured. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think yeah. it's it's about really understanding who are we trying to reach. And, it, and you know, in, in Hawaii, we have, of our population of about 1.4 million, 285,000 people are already on Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And um, God bless them because they need help. You know, they really do need that coverage. So we're really talking about a middle class uh, initiative here, which is kind of good. I think, as, as my colleagues were talking, other things will come up about um, that apathy question that you asked, which is very good. For instance, it won't just be us getting many more people covered. We're now taking on new things like transparency. So you're going, you're going to go onto the exchange, and you're going to really see how much it costs. A lot of people, if you ask them on the street, they don't know how much their insurance costs. Mm -hmm. People are going to see and make choices. I think there's going to be a movement of transparency. The New York Times covered it pretty um, elegantly about six months ago about how crazy different the costs can be and how consumers can't shop and know what things cost. I Steve think, Brill did it in Time Magazine also, yeah. whole yeah. issue, longest issue I ever saw Time do on a, <laughs> on a subject. Yeah. Incredible, and I think that this, this whole movement of the Health Care Reform Act is going to open up those uh, dialogues and so people will not just be consumers of their physician and their insurance plan, they're going to actually ask themselves, do I want this product, do I want this test, is this the right thing for me? That could make a big difference in healthcare. Uh, but but uh, but I wonder about that. I go in and see a doc. He says you do this. Yeah, I do that. Right? I mean, uh, I'm not smart enough. That you, you're saying I'd be smart enough to say I don't want that test. Come on, Josh. I, oh, I have. I had a patient a couple days ago who a asked me not to order an X-ray when I explained to them it was a very low probability they had a broken bone, and even if it was broken, I was going to do the same thing, which was to splint it. So that individual who was uninsured. <laughs> They knew they were going to get hit with the, the cost for the x-ray, the x-ray tech, me reading it, and some radiologist out in cyberspace reading it. They were pretty savvy. And they were thinking, do I spend $600 or do I trust that this is going to be the care for me? And then in Hawaii, it works because I call them the next day and a week later to say, hey, how you doing? So in Hawaii, we have that culture. But I, I do think that we're going to awaken a lot of people's interest. Some people will never ask. I agree. And Guys like me. <laughs> guys like you. And there are cultural um, realities, too. Uh, for instance, uh, the Filipino population is super um, respectful of the physicians to an extreme, I've noticed. And they never question uh, what one... I have in-laws that are, are Filipino, and they, they never question their physician, it seems. And then I have some Hali friends out from Kona they, they beef at me for every last little thing I recommend. So there's a lot of difference here. Mm -hmm. But I, I hope that as we've talked so much more about health care than I ever expected, that a lot of these issues come out. Oh, those Kona Hollis. Uh, I, can, I can't begin to tell you those pe people. Ginny, I, I, I read recently, like the Stephen Brill article and the New York Times thing, that the real problem is not insurance companies. Not insurance companies. The real problem is you folks, the providers. It's, it's the hospitals and the docs and the and the and they that that and you know the doctors' business. You guys know the doctors' business. So you primary care physicians, the lowest, the lowest of low in salary, the heart specialists, woo, 
are a, a breast cancer specialist, you guys get really get paid. And there's Her there's fault. unhappiness <laughs> with each other, and there's kind of sniping and so forth. I mean, it, it, will the Affordable Care Act really cause the price of, of health care to go down? Does it have any influence on it? Well, we're already seeing a decreasing trend in the rate of health care uh, costs. Uh, so believe it or not, over the last three years, the trend has been down. But this is the Medi economic recession. Medicaid, yeah. no, but in addition to the recession, the actual, uh, there's some fundamental changes in the way care is being provided and the utilization of care. People are getting smarter about, you know, what's necessary and what isn't. Physicians are becoming a little more aware of, well, do I really need that test? And is it really going to, is it going to change the way I'm going to care for that patient? And if it's not, Let's make sure the patient understands it's not going to necessarily change their care. Do they want that CT scan, which is going to create additional x-ray uh, radiation to them, which could cause problems in the future if it isn't going to change their care? So I th there has been a fundamental change in our health care delivery system for the better, which is becoming more efficient, more proactive, uh, getting patients more engaged in their care. Uh, making sure the patients are getting the follow-up that they need, understanding their care, getting pharmacists involved in their care so that they understand their medication. Uh, you know, the most, the most common reason for patients to get readmitted to the hospital after discharge is because they didn't understand or follow their, their discharge instructions and they didn't really connect up with their, with their primary care physician in a timely manner. So we're changing all those things now and making sure that that handoff is happening in a, in a seamless manner from, um, <coughs> from outpatient to inpatient to outpatient and that patients are getting the care that they need in the follow-up. Are you seeing that in the community well, yeah, hospitals? I was about to say, well, actually, between uh, Ginny's uh, conglomerate of HPH and us, we have uh, an agreement right now that everyone who's admitted to the hospital, any one of the um, uh, Hawaii Pacific Health hospitals, and that could be Kapiolani, Straub, et cetera, when they are admitted, we get notification on uh, uh, via our EHR immediately. So our care managers at the Waianae Coast already know that that patient is in the hospital. When they get discharged, the day that, the, that they're discharged, or the, at least the time that it's planned, we get notification. So our case managers are already on the job getting ready to contact that patient that's coming out of the that hospital. Is a major, major change from the way it was even just a year or two yes. ago. Yes, oh yeah, this is brand new. So. And so that allows us to get a head start. That allows someone from our organization to contact the patient. And I think we're going to be fine tuning that as time goes on, mm -hmm. where we have people in the hospital, they have people with us. We're going to be really back and forth quite a bit. And this is, this is all being enabled and helped through this organization of uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act, where we're going to get the costs down by this sort of organization and uh, integration of care that by, f uh, by force is going to lower the, co the, the cost of care and it's going to increase the quality, which as a patient is the most important thing. Yeah, and that, that health care delivery system change is, is the most important part of this. Getting everyone covered with insurance is important, mm -hmm. but it's the change in the health care delivery system that's really making fundamental changes in our health care. And a lot of this is happening because <laughs> there's incredible economic pressure from the very top. So right now what, what uh, the team here was alluding to, for instance, is there's going to be readmission rules. If someone goes back into the hospital within a month for the same health problem, the hospitals aren't going to get paid. And so there's a very, as you can imagine, a natural impetus for them to do a better job to keep people out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see a lot of the hospital services that you used to have start focusing on follow-up, start focusing on partnerships with Hawaii IPA, Hawaii Pacific Health, all these other large groups because they know that the system can't afford to have bad management of heart failure, someone comes back in two weeks later, another $20,000 admission, God forbid the person didn't feel well. That's why when I refer to people, um, you know, back in Kona asking those questions, I'm so pleased because they're asking the right questions for themselves. They're saying, do I need this? Is this going to benefit me? Is this a good use of my resources? So hopefully that's what will happen. But without those economic pressures, I'm not so sure that we would have ever really changed. Now the insurance companies are pressured. They're only allowed to take so much money for administration. Probably should still be smaller, but you know they're, they're really restricted somewhat. And all of these plans created to um, put more money into primary care are forcing the specialists to be more, um, I guess, judicious 
in the way they practice. So a lot of people are being forced to be more responsible and work on outcomes. Well, I, I noticed that you're using a three-year-old to take care of your thumb. I, I like the Band-Aid, Josh. That's my my two- and three-year-old, my two-year-old and six-year-old are already fully licensed physicians in the state of Hawaii. Yeah, uh, for, for thumbs and, and, uh, and paper slices. I just Go. wanted to build upon um, um, something that Josh said and a question that you asked, Dan, that had to do with, you know, cost. Um, we haven't talked about, you know, what the plans must include that are sold on the exchange. So some sort of standardization of benefits and it's like how do we move the how do we move from disease management to prevention, which is one of the areas of focus within the Affordable Care Act. And so there's something called essential health benefits. So the plans that are sold on the health insurance exchange or the connector have to include a certain standard of um, benefit options. So you know the one of those has to do with behavioral health. So for uh, so long, you know, medical services or uh, medical needs, not behavioral needs, have really been a priority in terms of what gets covered. So the essential health benefits, which I, in I encourage the community to take a look at those, are adding in opportunities for insurance coverage in areas that previously have not been covered. Uh, pediatric um, dental and vision, mm -hmm. habilitative services. Mm -hmm. And so by adding in the benefits, it allows people to access preventive services, thereby hopefully deferring you know, a cost later, later down the road. We're working to ensure that um, we remain focused on health literacy. So again, as we talk about how do you affect a change in enabling consumers to be better consumers of services, some of that is when we have the contact with them in the same way they have contact with consumers within the inpatient setting or with Josh in a clinic or an outpatient. There's a whole level of activity that's happening before folks ever encounter a service. Mm -hmm. So it's a balance of making sure that that education and insight is being given to the consumer so they make choices about uh, where they go for for care and how they how they spend their money. Uh, no, you were referring. To, uh, you, you had a good point earlier, saying, but how is this I being received? I have nothing but good points. Of course, yeah. I <laughs> good points are where I come the, from. How, how is this being received? The apathy factor and everything else. But you have to think about it for a second. That we are actually lagging far behind a lot of other co Western countries in the organization of our health care, in the quality measures that they're uh, already achieving. We're not number one when it comes to this. So we're, we're catching up. And I think this is the first salvo to really getting into the first world of health care. And as in anything of that sort, it's going to be a painful move and it's going to be a lot of uh, false moves and a lot of dead ends until we get the right path. But I think what's going to happen as time goes on is this is going to become the norm and the fact of these uh, services that are available and the fact that you enter into health care from an early age and continue through your adult life, that's going to become normal. This is the difficult part right now, getting people used to this mm -hmm. uh, in a state that's had traditionally very fragmented uh, health care delivery, very inefficient and very expensive, and to the detriment of, of many people. Yeah, and the exciting part is, we're, you know, we're not trying to just find a model from someplace else that isn't working that well either. Mm -hmm. We are moving into new directions and creating something uniquely American that others are soon going to be modeling after us, I exactly. believe, because we are going to leapfrog ahead of these others as we focus more and more on the quality piece. I mean, give you an example of one of the most common reasons for admissions to the emergency room is, is related to depression and primary care, you know, the, 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 and now what we're doing, it, because of the way we're changing the way health care gets paid for, is we're starting to put de depression screening and mental health and behavioral health issues embedded into the primary care setting so that these patients get access to the care that they need. But as that becomes mainstream so that everybody gets that comprehensive care, you're going to see just much better overall health of the population. In Not many to areas. mention people were depressed about our health care system. So yeah. uh, yes, that maybe too. if we'll get it right, we'll keep them out of the hospital. But you think it, you, you said, said earlier you think it's a work in progress. I do. Uh, and you think it's going to be tweaked a lot. I do. I think um, there are a lot of uh, large unknowns. The, uh, the movement towards health information uh, technology, very expensive cumbersome for some and necessary. We need to know what our healthcare problems are. We need to know how much uh, people are suffering with this and that disease. We need to know how much the cost is. Very difficult to implement that. 
I also think that um, though we've kind of hit the mark on getting people covered, I think we still have not, and we've missed the mark on uh, bringing more providers into the healthcare system. America is terrific because of the healthcare providers we have, they're among the world's best across the board. No one questions that. We have some of the best technology across all nations, but we have far too few primary care providers. We have not done enough with this bill to actually bring doctors into training. We have a finite number of medical schools. They are already at their max. Um, Wynai is doing a great thing. They've already begun a program, a medical school program. We're going to need to see a lot more of that. So when I say work in progress, I think the uh, 2.0 version of health care reform is going to have to focus on actually the uh, access points. Tell us a little bit more about that. The, this is a very interesting program. Um, the National Association of Community Health Centers got together uh, some years ago, about five, maybe even seven years ago now, and, and looked at this problem, said down the line, with the way we're going in the United States, trying to shift more into a primary care um, arena, who's going to take care of these people? And we weren't even really thinking at that point uh, of all these new folks coming in with the Affordable Care Act, just even then. So. At that point, um, what was going to happen? And how were we going to get the people that were going to take care of them? So they came up with an idea with, uh, we are affiliated with the A.T. Still School of Osteopathic Medicine, originally from Kirksville, Missouri, but now in Mesa, Arizona is another branch. They developed a plan where medical students would spend the first year at their campus, as all medical students do, doing their anatomy, et cetera, after which, for the second, third, and fourth year, they would all of a sudden go out to community health centers around the nation. Mm -hmm. And so 11 community health centers, that's 110 students. These students were also picked and actually interviewed for the medical school with the idea that they were already interested in primary care. Right. These students were self-selected. We're, we're doing a school that focuses on primary care in the communities, imbued with that day in, day out. We have second year med students who follow us two days a week with our patients already touching, hearing, talking to our patients in the clinic. They get to know, the patients get to know them, they get to know the patient. So there's already an attitude there. Second and third years, they're in the community of choice, wherever they are in the states, doing all their follow-ups in the hospitals in that area and also outpatient. So what we're doing is this last year that graduated from our uh, center in Waianae, 97 percent went into residencies that uh, were primary care residencies. So it's having an effect. It's a small, it's a small start, but this could be exponential over time. Uh, uh, we're running low on time and we're running high on questions from yeah. the audience. Mm. So, so please little restraint here, and, uh, but let's try to get through, through some of these. Why hasn't the state been more visibly and actively involved in informing and engaging the community and letting them know about the changes? The state has an educational role. Where are they? May I clarify? Yes. Is it the state, meaning state government? I think so, yes. Okay. Um, um, the state is actively present, at least in the uh, discussions at our board, uh, on our board. There are four cabinet members represented on our board and all of our meetings are in the public, so I would say that's one level of engagement. We, as I mentioned, we are moving um, into a more, um, uh, com more public-facing community outreach uh, activity and uh, we will be working very closely with the governor's office being, uh, to get that public message out. And uh, so I would just say, hold tight, we're hold coming. Tight. And hold your, tight, And I'm your health chairman, so I'll tell you, mm -hmm. go to the uh, website on October 1st, and you're going to see a lot of information. But Coral also hired someone to go into each region, two on Big Island, several people right. in each county. So I think you're going to see a ton of activity now. Bruce and Makiki says, choice seems to be a guise to make people feel that premiums aren't going to increase. But now we have to, we've got, had a pretty good employer paid health insurance program. Now we've got to take care of these uninsurable, uninsurable people. Doesn't it raise rates for everyone in Hawaii? Actually, no. 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 No, that's the whole point because the people who don't have insurance now, generally speaking, are the healthy young ones who say, I don't need it, I'm invincible. So if they're covered by insurance as well, it reduces the cost per person. If, if you have everybody covered, mm -hmm. including the healthy as well as those who are really sick, then it reduces the cost per person for everybody. And this is a fundamental, important point that, that Bruce brings up, and that is, if you're in society and you can't take care of the people that live one door down from you and three doors up, what good are we? So I say, let's get over our, our differences. It is, yes, expensive in healthcare in general, but 
if people didn't have insurance and they did it wrong by coming to see again me in the ER, we all paid for it. The state has yep. very large budgets. Over $80 million goes to HHSC, our public hospitals. $250 million of uncompensated care at all the private facilities. And where do you think that money comes from at the end of the day? It comes from taxpayers who I'm extremely grateful to <laughs> because they actually take care of these individuals. This is doing it systematically and better. Uh, it's going to be bumpy, but I think um, we'll hopefully answer Bruce's question in time and, and realize what Jenny said, which is it'll be cheaper. Dan, may I just yep. say something to that? And I think this is where, as a society, we have to push ourselves beyond a um, discussion that's currently taking place about, I mean, this is what I heard, the uninsured, why am I responsible for them? Mm -hmm. I, would, I would really go push back and I would say, first of all, who are the uninsured? And we talked about that earlier. It's my neighbor. It's, you know, people that are out there uh, not, not creating, the, you know, these things. They're dragging on the system. They're not pulling up their bootstraps. They're not. I would say to the listeners, ask around. Have a conversation with your community. Who are the uninsured? And so, you know, what, what the exchange is enabling is a marketplace where these individuals and small businesses have not had the leverage in the market to be able to access health insurance. It's not for a lack of trying by many. And then for small businesses, again, for many, they're not going to feel much change because we already have the prepaid health care act. But if they want to shop and access tax credits, um, they can access those tax credits now. After 2014, they will only be available on the um, health insurance exchange. And we have plenty more information. HawaiiHealthConnector.com. Please go there. We're trying to populate it as quickly as we can. What was that again? Can. Hawaii what? HawaiiHealthConnector.com. HawaiiHealthConnector.com, you said. That's it. All right. Uh, is there going to be something in writing that guarantees coverage for pre-existing conditions? I don't trust this will happen. <laughs> it's, it's, in in the, it's in the law. law. It's in the law. It's in the law. Yeah, it's in, it's the, in the federal law. law. So if you turn somebody back, uh, uh, your hospital door, you say... Uh, uh, well, we don't turn anybody away anyway. Right. Under any circumstances. But, but, but if it's an insurance company, turn so somebody they down. Can't. They can't. HMSA can't do that. No. No. Kaiser can't do that. Nope. No one. That's a no one, That was actually so. Some of the fundamental things that happened in the Affordable Care Act a couple of years ago were the best things. Can't be refused insurance for pre-existing conditions. If you're up to age 26, you get coverage. A lot of these other things are going to be trials. There'll be trial balloons. God willing, they'll work. But um, this, the core essentials aren't going away. Uh, based on his experience of needing cancer treatment costing $450,000 at age 50, he is strongly in favor of everything getting. Everyone getting health insurance, it should be called Obamacare. Is this chairman of the Democratic Party? <laughs> thought, uh, no. Uh, Dan, oops, I, I, I do want to acknowledge the role the state has been playing in partnership with what, what we've been building, um, um, just so that the community understands. Um, the IT build uh, very heavily involved in uh, Office of Information Management and Technology, which is working on a, a broader re-engineering of the technology system. So we're leveraging federal funds in partnership with the state. And I do want to acknowledge the role that they've played in that. Department of Human Services, as I said, has an eligibility and enrollment system. So DCCA, DLIR with a prepaid, they're not sitting idly by. Um, and I think also for our community to understand, you know, for a state like California, when they're going to engage folks from Hollywood and do mass media, that's the way they're going to go about their campaign. For Hawaii, we want to make sure that we continue to foster trust in the message that we're sharing with our community. So our approach is going to be very much grassroots, community to community. And as Josh said, you know, we have hired island leads who emanate from their communities, and we want to continue to ensure that the, the folks have access to those that really understand the, the issues uh, within, their, within their own communities. Ginny, I think this one's after you. If ACA is reducing costs, why are Kaiser and HMSA raising their rates every year? <laughs> I didn't say that the costs have come down. I said the rate of increase is, is, is slowing down. I mean, we had, a decade ago, we had double-digit increases in insurance rates every year. Over the last uh, three years or so, the rates have been increasing at you know only like three to five percent or less. And for Medicaid across the country, rates have actually decreased. The actual cost per capita have actually decreased. And for Medicare, the the, the rate has only been like two three percent so of increases. So we have reduced the cost trend, reducing mm -hmm. the rate of increase in the cost trend. And as we continue to begin, become more efficient and smarter about the way we provide care that cost trend will continue to come down. And I, I would challenge the people too who are watching and, and listening uh, that as, as this um, gets into place, 
press the insurance companies, press the providers, press the hospitals that if we as citizens step up to the plate and are responsible, demand that we get benefits, that we get um, uh, monies back, that we're actually uh, receiving um, certain uh, perks uh, if we've remained insured. That's really what would be extraordinary, that if uh, you are able to go to a, a new plan that for some reason is now chosen to go onto the exchange and actually give some monies back to you if you are a model patient. Well, and I would say we're all responsible for controlling the health care costs. It's not just the insurance companies, it's the physicians, it's, the, it's all of the people listening that we need to be more proactive and engaged in our health care Together, we can all reduce costs. How much will an affordable plan cost, Coral? Come on, give me dollar numbers. Come on, come on, come <laughs> I on. I knew come that on. question was going to come. Let's have it. So, uh, within Act 205, the insurance division, you know, is going through that process of actually um, reviewing rates, and so we don't know that information. You haven't got yet. a number, do you? No, I don't. You came here tonight without a number on an affordable. I'm ashamed. I of will. You. I will say to the community that you know every market is different. So as you as you are a if you are a voracious reader out there and you are looking at the information at the national level, just recognize that every market has its own variables, and so we have a high rate of coverage here. Some markets have a high rate of uninsured, and the small business side, the small business um, um, market is going to play out slightly differently probably than the individual side of the market. So. We're still going to be learning about, you know, how Hawaii's market is going to respond to this change. But, um, you know, over time, we do anticipate more and, you know, more issuers coming forward. Uh, we've had a lot of interest, so I don't want to not acknowledge that we've had a lot of interest. I think for the mid and smaller size issuers, they're probably going to take a wait and see approach. Uh, but they, they, they are looking forward to participating. But for the individuals, they're, you know, up to 400% of federal poverty, there's significant uh, subsidies right. from the subsidies. federal government. So That's for correct. someone who's at, say, 200% of federal poverty, they are only allowed to pay, what, 2 or 3% of mm -hmm. their, by, by the Affordable Care Act, there's a, there's a threshold. They can only pay a certain percentage right. of their income, and the rest has to be subsidized. And, so, so, and some of the states that have already mm -hmm. uh, basically uh, employed the Affordable Care Act and have, have a little bit ahead of us on, right, on it's, it, they're showing the rates have actually come down. They That's were surprised right. that they were, the rates were better than they thought. So. Right. So well, Massachusetts has gone the furthest exactly. though, right? Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. But there are other states that also have uh, already mm -hmm. put into effect. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I, I got to bring this up. Uh, despite low, low dollar penalty attached uh, to not having insurance, couldn't the fact that it's the law be enough of a stick to get people to buy insurance? Uh, I don't get this business with you. What, what is this? This is, this is like you parked illegally, uh, you didn't buy your insurance, so they're going to give you a ticket? This is my big concern right now, and that's that uh, as of now, the, the way it's, gonna, it's built, and I never liked this part, was there's going to be penalties and it's going to be run by the IRS, which is clunky and there are trust questions. I think that this is going to have to be uh, continuously revisited because uh, right now it is true. In the first year or two, the penalty would be very small. It grows to, to several hundred dollars. I think it's like six hundred and six hundred ninety dollars by the third or fourth year, uh, but that's still far, far less than it would cost to get insured. So. A lot of moving parts are going to have to come together. First, people will have to trust the system, and they'll have to see if the subsidies are meaningful enough. And then we'll actually have to see what the feds do with that money. Right. If they're going to invest it in places like YNI and access points, paying for primary care, how will it make a difference? So there are big questions still out there. Yeah, how this but, will but, work. but part of this problem, Josh, is in 2010, a whole election campaign, national campaign, was run against Obamacare. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. and the president slid it through. Uh, uh, had, had to, he didn't have his 59 votes, uh, ran against him. The opinion polls, as recently as May, or uh, show that 43 percent of the folks don't d have doubts about it. Isn't this a crapshoot? Uh, uh, isn't Obamacare, uh, the Affordable Care Act, a crapshoot? I mean, all the good work that you're doing. Do we really know if this thing's going to work? And if it doesn't work, there are folks ready to just tear it apart. You have a whole yeah. table of clinicians yeah. sitting, sitting here in front of you. And um, I'm not going to speak for my colleagues, but I can just say after 30 years of working in healthcare, you know, we have some real issues that need to be improved upon. And so when you bring forward health policy change, um, you, you drive forward with the best process. It's a political process, right? So mm -hmm. Josh and I were just talking about you know, what 
options um, existed before the final passage and what the law actually came out with. So what I have observed is that the components of it are addressing some of the things that resonate in those experiences in working in healthcare. Um, and, and so, you know, I think you just take a bite of the apple, you inform yourself, you go back, you take another bite of the apple. But so my feeling is there will be change. We've got less than a minute. We have to do something. The, the, we were going to bankruptcy. The whole system was imploding. What are we going to do? We have to try something. We're doing something that is forward-looking, is more um, equanimous, equanimous, that gives more of an opportunity for everyone to be involved in it, gives everyone some health care, gives quality, is going for, for wellness, prevention, and quality. You can't do much better than that. In five years, a public option will be, uh, people will clamor for it, and the exchanges will evolve to allow that. That will be the next phase. Meanwhile, processes like Jenny's putting into place for quality will also improve health care. It's going to evolve. The it's good things are going to stick, and the things that aren't working will get fixed. It's going to evolve. Thank you all very, very much. I feel overwhelmed and honored that you're all here, and I hope you're all right that it's going to work. In two weeks on Insights, we'll ask the question, how will the Affordable Care Act affect Hawaii seniors, uninsured, and part-time workers? Both Medicaid for low-income residents and Medicare for Hawaii senior citizens will see some changes in coverage particularly in preventive screenings and drug plans. But how will Obamacare work for this diverse population? What is the law's timetable? And, what can, and when can we see real changes? Our guests will include representatives from HMSA, AARP Hawaii, the Queen's Medical Center, and the Hawaii Chamber of Commerce. That's next time on Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Dan Borman. Ahoy home.